Good morning. Um, this is Reza Talai. Uh, we are here with another interview for SID podcast. And here we have uh, Olga. And the first question I have for Olga is that please introduce yourself. It's very nice to be here. Thank you very much for inviting me for this interview. My name is Olga Martin, and um, uh, I'm a radiation biologist. This is the title of my position in the Division of Radiation Oncology and Cancer Imaging in Peter McCollum Cancer Center in Melbourne, Australia. Thank you, Olga. I know you had a long history of working for NIH, and can you explain a little bit about the research you did there? Uh, yes, so maybe I can start a little bit earlier, yeah, uh, what it. actually brought me there. Um, I, uh, I was in the laboratory of immunopathology initially and cytopathology. So um, I did my PhD in the National Cancer Center in Moscow. And uh, right after I got my PhD, I was looking for a postdoctoral position. And uh, very fortunately, I um, was in the laboratory that, at NIH that um, conducted radiation research. Since then, I, um, I'm in the field of radiation research. Initially, uh, I worked in a small esoteric field uh, related to Auger electrons. And uh, it actually also uh, had a very nice link to my future research with gamma H2X as a marker of double strand breaks. Because when we started collaborating initially with Bill Bonner, we showed that if we treat cells with uh, iodine-125 uh, UDR, mm -hmm. which induces um, one double strand break per decay, yes. and then when you immunostain the cells with gamma H2X, then you can find a very nice correlation between the number of double strand breaks and the uh, number of gamma H2X for site. So from there, we established that one focus is uh, one double strand break at least one radiation-induced double strand break. So this formed the base for the quantitative assay of application uh, of gamma H2X facile assay for uh, many basic research fields and uh, uh, further for translational research. So I worked with uh, Bill Bonner and team for more than 10 years at NCI and um, we applied gamma H2X for CISA for many different applications for such fields as uh, aging, uh, non-targeted effects. So we were first to show that um, uh, DNA damage accumulates in bystander cells, even though they were not irradiated. So then uh, I think I was very fortunate that uh, I had an opportunity to work in um, a big radiotherapy center. So I uh, got a position in um, Peter McCallum Cancer Center in Division of uh, Radiation Oncology and Cancer Imaging. And um, there, uh, since this is, a, this is the biggest uh, radiotherapy center in Australia and one of the largest centers in the world, uh, it's about uh, 6,000 patients every year that receive radiotherapy in uh, Peter McCollum Cancer Center. So it's a huge opportunity for translational research. So I have a question here. So you started with basic science and then you moved to an applicable uh, environment in the oncology department. Did you use any of the assets you developed in your basic research laboratory in the in translational research part that you moved on? at the next step? Exactly. Because we, we learned a lot about this biomarker. Yeah. And we know that um, the properties of uh, gamma H2X formation and kinetics are different in directly irradiated cells and in non-targeted cells. For example, in directly irradiated cells, we know that response goes fast. Uh, maximum response is detected at about uh, 15 minutes to one hour of post-irradiation, and then uh, double strand break repair and gamma h 2 signal goes down. While in non-targeted cells, it's a very slow accumulation. So the peak in bystander tissues uh, reaches uh, the maximum uh, about, uh, I would say, if, if, these are, if these are tissues, it could take several days 
to reach the peak. And then the signal stays, and then it slowly goes down. So this is very interesting, because kinetics are different, and based on gamma H2x kinetics, you can, you can distinguish which cells were directly irradiated and which cells uh, got uh, DNA damage because of, uh, because of bystander signaling. So uh, it was um, good uh, basic science knowledge that uh, uh, I applied in my translational research. So this was the core of my research around which uh, I built uh, other biomarkers. And everything uh, I do now, it's basically to monitor to monitor uh, normal tissue response in radiotherapy patients. So usually localized radiation is considered to be just a local treatment, okay. but uh, it's a lot of things that are going around the body and uh, we would like to know how is it possible to monitor all these normal tissue effects to personalize radiation therapy. Is it possible to say that, uh, uh, so what is going to happen to this patient? Is this patient going to develop acute toxicity? Is the patient going to develop uh, long-term toxicity? So at the moment, it's absolutely impossible to predict because no biomarkers exist over to, to, yeah. to, to predict so, it. So, yeah, I noticed you have some publications about lung cancer. Are you looking at the normal tissue for the parts that are directly irradiated, or do you look at normal tissue response for the tissues that get affected indirectly for, and, and they are not irradiated? Uh, we are looking for effects in both uh, tissues, indirectly irradiated and uh, uh, out of field tissues. And the study that we presented here is um, uh, related to monitoring DNA damage in directly irradiated tissues and the model for this is blood because blood is circulating uh, through irradiated volume and the model for non-targeted tissues is uh, eyebrow hair follicles. So the lung cancer patients, they, they received their local irradiation with absolutely minimal scatter dose in eyebrow hairs. And uh, nevertheless, we detected uh, accumulation of DNA damage after 24 hours post first fraction of radiotherapy. And this DNA damage stayed there for a long time for through all the course of radiotherapy. And then it, eventually it went down. We also, we try to find uh, we try to find some uh, mediators, and it's known that uh, cytokines uh, mediate uh, bystander effects and abscopal effects. So we measured uh, the plasma levels of uh, 22 different cytokines, which are related to inflammation and radiation response, and we uh, found a small panel of cytokines that are responsive. Uh, and. Uh, they can, can be potentially associ associated with the uh, abscopal DNA damage. Yeah, and the next question I have, uh, uh, what sites of cancer do you look at? Is it only lung or do you work on the other sites of cancer? Uh, I work a lot uh, on several uh, translational projects with the lung cancer team. Mm -hmm. And um, another project for lung cancer, for example, is uh, association of uh, radiotherapy and circulating tumor cells. Okay. So we are looking at the number and um, bio at, at um, markers of uh, epithelial and mesenchymal markers uh, in these uh, CTCs that are released during radiotherapy, uh, looking for association with uh, prognosis of these patients and also with um, uh, metastasis that uh, unfortunately is uh, very common after lung cancer radiotherapy. So except uh, lung cancer patients, um, we are doing very interesting research which is related basically to any type of cancer. So we, um, we are trying to find, um, uh, uh, to, to develop a prognostic test for uh, late effects for uh, late normal tissue toxicity. So this is, um, this is a problem that is still, still not solved. Uh, there were many studies that tried to develop such a biomarker, but unfortunately, they, uh, none of them uh, made their way to clinic because it's either 
sensitivity is too low or uh, it, they are too time taking. Mm -hmm. And uh, recently we published a paper in Cancer Letters, which um, in, in this paper we showed that um, if we monitor gamma H2 kinetics in um, over responders, and we had a mixed group of over responders who were um, uh, cancer X radiotherapy cancer patients uh, which developed late normal tissue toxicity months and years after radiotherapy and uh, still suffer because of these toxicities. And as control, we had um, a group of X radiotherapy patients that um, uh, went through the treatment but did not develop any sign of radiation toxicity. So we collected blood samples, we irradiated lymphocytes, and uh, we followed gamma H2X kinetics. And um, then we found that if you apply statistical criteria to assess, to describe these gamma H2X kinetics, then you can st statistically based on the algorithm, which we actually called radiosensitivity map, you can distinguish these two groups with very high prediction power. Mm -hmm. So we had about 97% sensitivity uh, of this assay. So, so far, this is the best <laughs> result ever. Yeah, <laughs> so we, nice. yeah, we, hope, we hope that uh, we will be able to apply this assay for the prospective study and maybe uh, in future for clinic. It's interesting you have a wide range of uh, projects. Which one of them did you bring to radiation research this year? What's your presentation here? Well, we had, we had two posters uh, this year. One poster is um, this uh, uh, statistical algorithm to distinguish radiosensitive patients and non-radiosensitive patients. And uh, uh, the other poster is um, uh, on uh, monitoring DNA damage in directly irradiated tissues and uh, out-of-field tissues in lung cancer radiotherapy patients. Interesting. Is there any specific project that you are still having a lot of interest in it and I have not asked question? You are free to explain about that. Yeah, so we, yeah. we are working on lots of projects. Yeah. Well, of course, um, this um, distinguishing of um, uh, radi radiosensitive patients, this is the most interesting thing that uh, we are working on right now. And this actually can be, can be extended to uh, other fields. For example, we want to apply our algorithms to a group of patients uh, which as children had radiotherapy. Mm -hmm. And then uh, when they became adult, they, they developed second cancers. And we have three groups of patients. So we have patients who developed br breast cancer and thyroid cancer and meningioma. And we have uh, best match controls for these patients. So right now we are starting gamma H2X kinetics uh, there, DNA repair capacity. So we want to compare uh, DNA repair capacity in these patients and uh, in uh, uh, non-over responders. And perhaps if we are successful to show the differences between these two groups, maybe potentially it could be a test for prediction of uh, uh, radiation response in children. Yes. And I know your projects are demanding and you're working with a lot of group of people with different expertise. Can you give us some information about the experience you had with working with the clinicians, physicists, and uh, other people that you work with? Yes. Uh, this. These projects that um, I'm working on, they first they request require um, expertise in radiation biology. They require expertise in radiation oncology, and they require a mathematical approach. So uh, we are now moving to um, a long-term collaboration with statistical team mm -hmm. uh, at our institution. But uh, so far, we just had one lab member, in, uh, Pavel Lobachevsky, who is a mathematician by uh, education, and um, he actually, uh, it, was, uh, it was his uh, big effort to, uh, to quantitate our biological data and to develop this uh, radiosensitivity algorithm. And uh, 
regarding working with clinicians, yeah, I think it's, it's very rewarding. So I think it's, um, uh, it's just amazing when you do something, when you, when you uh, bring, uh, bring your knowledge from basic research team and you apply it to real patient material and you're trying to, to bring some, some differences in the current uh, status of their treatment and uh, uh, you have a very nice and supportive team of clinicians. I think it's, this is the best, the best thing that can, can happen. Yeah. And uh, my final question is that, what do you see the future of your research? Uh, which avenues do you think you are going through? The future, um, of course, uh, it, would be, it would be great to have genomic markers for all these responses. But so far, unfortunately, uh, for prediction of radiosensitivity, uh, regardless huge efforts around the world, we don't have these markers. Eventually, we will have, I believe that we will have genomic markers. But um, I think functional assays, uh, they, they also have future. And perhaps it's a combination of functional assay and genomic assays that uh, will lead us to uh, really predicting personalized response of radiotherapy patients. Thank you, Olga, and uh, thank you for accepting our interview, and uh, we learned a lot. Thank oh. you very much. Thank you.